Hi, welcome to Sustain Talks. Today, I'm joined by a good friend of mine, Karen Hutchins. Karen is the Global Head of Travel, Meetings and Events at EY and one of the most respected leaders in the business travel industry. I've been looking forward to this conversation as in some businesses, travel can be up to 80% of carbon emissions and it can be a challenge to reduce them as face-to-face -face meetings are important. But when you look at the recent IPCC report, reduction is key. Karen, it is so good to have you here. How are you? I'm good. And thank you for having me, Sam, and for that wonderful introduction. I must say, we do go back many, many years, don't we, indeed? We <laughs> certainly do. But things have really changed. I, I just want to start. Not everybody that um, follows me knows you. So I'd like to start a little bit with you describing what you do and your job and the industry that you're in. Perfect. So um, I'm not going to say how many years I've been in the industry because I'm trying not to age myself anymore. But let's just say I always wanted to be in the travel meetings and events in industry from a very young age. And I have been in it for quite some time. So really what the role entails now, though, is the responsibility of the airlines, the hotels, ground transport agencies, venue sourcing agencies, technology companies, you name it, any supplier that relates to travel meetings and events, the team and I are responsible for. And then it's around the service as well. So we procure and purchase those elements. And then we're also delivering the service. So it's a very broad spectrum, but an ever-changing role, to be honest with you. And if I think about the first travel manager role I had versus what I do now, it really is very, very different. And I would say part of that is the focus on sustainability. And then the other one would be around digitalization. And I think those are the two key areas that we've really morphed into when we think about the responsibilities that we have and what takes up a large part of the time that we spend on now. Yeah, and actually, I mean, you know, having been in the travel industry for eight years myself before doing this, I think even over the last few years, the changes, especially because of COVID and everything else, how do you think the business has really changed over the last three years? Um, what, what sort of differences have you seen? Well, I think, you know, the industry took probably the largest hit of any industry through COVID because the borders shut. Yeah. I think what was interesting, though, is that it proved that we could actually still do business and not have to be in front of everybody. And I think that was probably the biggest fundamental change that happened when we think about post pandemic. Um, obviously there is still a desire and a need for in-person face-to-face meetings, but I think to just immediately jump on a plane to be in front of somebody, I think people now at least second guess that as to whether that is the right thing to do immediately. And I would say that's probably the biggest change that we've seen um, because the industry was just hit so much as well. You know, it took a very long time and still schedules of airlines are not back to where they were. There are still some floors in hotels still closed because the staffing is still a big issue in the industry because it was such a volatile time and so many people lost their roles it's difficult to encourage people to come back again. Yeah. And then I guess the over the last year and a half, two years, we've seen sustainability. Um, how much is, a, a, is that a priority for you and in your business? Well, it's huge. I mean, EY was very clear. They came out with some very robust targets back in January 21. And if I talk about what that relates to business travel, so as an example, 70% plus of EY scope three emissions come from business travel. And then what the statement was in the target was that we would reduce our business travel emissions by 35% by 2025, which then enables EY to be net zero. So for us, it's a significant role that we have to play in EY actually delivering to those targets. So it's really, really become the forefront of everything that we do now in how do we make sure that we deliver to that target specific to business travel. 
Yeah, that's such a massive transformation. Um, how, you know, where do you start to reduce that much of your business travel emissions? What kind of things do you do then to say, you know, to transform it? So, I mean, the first thing that we did was amend our policy. So we brought in some key behaviour changes that would change the policy as well. And so one of those would have been the um, elimination of day trips. So in FY19, 18% of our travel was day trips, flights. And so we actually made them out of policy. And so we've now seen them reduced down to 3% already as a result of that movement now. There will always be exceptions, but to go from 18% of your air tickets issued to 3% is a huge reduction when you consider we were purchasing over a million air tickets a year. Clearly not as many as that now post-pandemic, but um, certainly we were buying a lot. The other one was looking at is where rail is a viable option to air, that we push our employees to actually take the rail option and we do that in a number of ways. Um, one of them is using robotics and nudging our employees to do the right thing. And then we have approval processes in place as well, which encourages good behaviour. And then the third thing that we really did was focusing on how many people are going to the same meeting and actually flagging to the travel approver. If five people have been approved to a meeting, which is destination date, um, then if some number six comes along to say that they want to go, then we flag that there's already five people approved. So the approver is armed with more information to potentially challenge if anybody else needs to go to that same meeting. And so we put those three items in our policy. And for me, that was taking real tangible efforts because it's one thing, in my opinion, to purchase SAF. The challenge we have with SAP is it's just limited out there as to the volumes that there is to be able to buy. And I think you need to fundamentally change the behaviour and reduce the volume that you travel to really deliver to what we should be doing. And so that's why we did what we did in relation to the policy. Yeah, that's brilliant. How has it been received from the travellers? Have they, you know, have they accepted? Do they want to take their sustainability more seriously and stop travelling? I know that there's so many people in, like, sustainability plays a huge part in EY with your consultants as well. But do they do they see that and accept that and realise that? Well, it was interesting when um, when people were off the road. So when there was no travel happening, we did a lot of like sessions with our top travellers just to get their sentiment about how they were feeling. Mm -hmm. And I think one thing that was overwhelming for us is they didn't want to go back to the volume of travel that they were doing before. I think mm -hmm. they realised that there was a hamster wheel that they were on and it was actually a desire to not go back to the, that practice as it was and so actually it's been easier than we probably anticipated in the fact they weren't interested in doing the same bon volume now of course there is still going to be high volume travel because ultimately we are selling individuals consultancy services so a lot of it is built on relationships but the reality is though is that there is many other ways that they can still do that that they learn through the lockdown using virtual technologies, et cetera. And so that's the key thing that we've been able to focus on and still deliver to our clients, but just in a different way. I think as well, we have to be clear that our clients have their own set goals of what they need to deliver from a sustainability perspective. And um, one of the new tools that we've just instigated is where our client serving team can calculate what are their emissions going to be to service a particular client. And so they have visibility and can share that with their customer to say, this is how much our emissions will be serving you, or we could reduce that down based on what their requirements are. That's brilliant. And actually that then gets the client involved and then they feel that they don't want to push for the um, in-person meetings as well because they could, they have that visibility. It, it almost sort of... Um, fits into um, carbon budgeting. Is that something that you're doing yet? Is it something that you think is going to come? We've set it. So we've set carbon budgets just to create the visibility. 
We still have financial budgets, which ultimately what everybody needs to adhere to. But we have put carbon budgets in place just so that so that service line leaders or country managing partners can understand what the volume may equate to. Because I think everything's still an education process here. Um, you know, I, I'm trying to ed educate myself all the time in the ESG world because there are a lot of technical words used out there. And I'll be very candid, I don't necessarily understand them at all. And so what I try to do is put things into layman terms so that they become tangible. And I think the fact that we look at a, a financial number and then equate that to carbon makes people then understand what it means. And then if we equate the carbon to the number of flights that that may reflect, then that again educates people more. So that's really why we've done it. It's not something that we're strictly adhering to that you can't go over your carbon budget. But I'm not saying that that's not going to come either, though, because this was the first step just to bring the visibility now. I think as we go in into the future, then we'll be looking at how do we actually set them that people have to adhere to. Yeah. So you must, um, I mean, going through all that, and I, I love that you said that, and that's exactly what I try and do, simplify sustainability. Uh, it's why I do this podcast. It's why I do the webinars. It's um, for, for some people, they can be really complex terms, but actually I like to really explain it so that everyone can understand and realise what they need to do. But you must work really closely with your sustainability team. Do you think that that, um, travel manager, uh, sustainability manager, do you think they're merging their relationships together a lot more? Definitely. Uh, yeah, I mean, especially in organisations where business travel is such a high percentage of the emissions, we actually have somebody from the ESG team seconded into our team to help us make our programme more sustainable you know, we, we can go out and educate ourselves, but actually you need expertise as well. And so we've got somebody that's come in and it has just been a huge benefit for us. And whether it be understanding sustainable aviation fuel and what that means and where it's sourced and where it comes from, but also putting together our meetings and events, ESG guidelines, They've been hugely, hugely beneficial for us. And then on the flip side, the, the conversations that we are constantly having with the sustainability leaders across EY has increased a thousand percent um, wow. because ultimately, you know, it has such a big impact, business travel for EY in general. Because if we don't deliver to the goal in business travel, EY will not succeed in what their goals are necessarily. And so that's why we have to work so closely. And it's been fantastic, to be honest with you, to work with very, very different people than we would ordinarily have been working with, which has been great. Yeah, it really has. And so I guess then even the, the average um, travel manager role is going to have to develop and they're going to have to educate themselves. You know, not everyone's got a sustainability team, so they're going to have to educate themselves more on sustainability so that they can manage it within their business, no matter what size their programme is. Definitely. And, I, you know, I see it as an opportunity. You yeah. know, if you think about the challenges you have to attract people into the industry, I hate to say it, if, if our talking track to get people in the industry is about online booking tool compliance or um, policy adherence. Who wants to join that? But if you can go out and start to talk about how can you support your company's sustainability program, your ESG guides or, or targets, or how do you digitalize something, that makes things much more interesting to come and join. And I think that's what we need to do is change the talk track so we can encourage more people to come into the industry. Yeah, I think so. And I, I mean, I find it such a fascinating topic and it can go in so many different directions. And um, what about the technology? Because obviously for a lot of travel managers, they don't know how to measure their carbon emissions. Do you think the technology is out there and is there some good tools that are helping and uh, uh, are they are they accurate? What, what do you think about the technology? 
Yeah, I mean, I think there are tools out there. Um, we're fortunate in the fact that we have an analytics team within our team. And so everything as it relates to business travel comes from our analytics team and they're the ones that pr produces the data. We're very conservative as well. So we actually, we use the TMC data as our single source of truth, but we do also mark it up a lot as well because we realize that not everything goes through that place. And we certainly don't want to be underestimating whatever our emissions are. So we use that data with a percentage markup on it. And we're very fortunate with the team that we have to be able to deliver that. I think you are seeing more and more companies out there that are looking at how do they solve for the data elements. And I think what's good about it is a lot of them are diverse owned companies as well, which mm -hmm. actually is a good reason to look at some of those and to how they can support your business too. We are just in a unique position with what we get access to at EY from a reporting capabilities perspective. Um, but yes, I would say definitely there are companies out there for sure. Yeah, and that's really interesting about the markup. Um, what what is that markup? What's the percentage? Um, I don't want to quote the number because I know it recently changed, but we we do it based on we have finance data which shows our true T and E expenditure and the airlines etc. and ground transport, and then we have the TMC and it's the it's the delta between the two that we yeah. then mark up from. I think that's really good, though, because certainly with um, carbon emissions, we have to go. It's We've got to go beyond net zero. You know, we've got to go a bit further. And if we're using sort of average baselines, they're going to be slightly off. So we're not going to get where we need to get to. And um, what other technology is coming? You've developed something in EY, I believe. Yes, so we, um, we've developed our own um, sustainable travel approval tool, EY Stat. And this was really on the back of the announcements that EY made around the targets that we had set to be net zero by 2025. And the reality was is that there was the statements that went out there, but how do we put the power into our employee hands to make the right decision? And so basically we took the emphasis away from price and we put it squarely onto carbon kilos. And so basically when people want to do a trip now, they go in and request their, they go in and ask for their travel approval, but they're searching by carbon versus by price. It does give the price as well, but it very clearly gives though what the carbon kilos would be on the particular trip. So as an example, Paris, London, it will give you the flight in business class, in economy, and then it will give you rail. And this is where we've been able to see fundamental behaviour changes with people now seeing what the difference is between the two. But what's really good about the tool, in my opinion, is the fact that it's very relatable. So, for example, on that Paris to London trip, if you decided to fly instead of take rail, it will say to you that it will take a tree 10 years to grow to offset that decision that you've just made. And it wow. goes back to the point that I made earlier, make things tangible and understandable because if there's a difference of 50 kilos of carbon, well, what does that actually mean? Nobody really knows what that means, but this actually tells you what that means. You know, how many houses are lit for however many days? How many mobile phone charges is that, for example? And so that's what we've done with this tool. So. We've gone live now in 40 plus countries, um, more are being out uh, constantly. And just one example in Poland where rail is a really good viable option to air domestically, we saw the share go from 20% rail to 67% after the tool was implemented. So we're taking that as an absolute success story. And so really pushing now in those countries where they also have high rail opportunity uh, and that's where it really comes into its own but it's also though just creating that visibility of what is the difference between business class and economy now we have a lot of economy policy to be honest with you but it is that education piece and we know that you know there was a survey done that 70 percent of people want to work for a company that has a strong esg um base and so when you think about that and our employees can see how seriously we're taking it, yes, 
EY has very, very strong targets to have, but actually then seeing that they can make a difference by their own actions really then makes it tangible. I love that. I love that that visual tool. And, you know, who wouldn't look at that and then say, oh, I'm going to fly or I'm going to um, fly business class when there's no need to, because they can really see and that that's when it makes sense. And actually, <laughs> it's going to make people feel good about the trip they're doing and to reconsider what they're doing and really understand what um, what they're doing to the planet by by clicking on that before they've even booked the trip. And I think that that's the important thing that for a lot of people, they'll book it and then they'll get their calculations. But you need to know beforehand and and that I, I i really look forward to that developing and hopefully developing in the industry as well um i i as we um come towards the end i, I wanted to uh, touch a little bit on events um that's a big part of of your business do you think that there is a way that we can make events more sustainable and if so how yeah, I mean, we came up really with a, a five point plan that we talk about with meetings and events. And this is what we sort of speak to each of our stakeholders about when they want to organize an event. So one of the things to consider is have a venue that you can reach by public transport. So you don't have to have car transfers, as an example. The second one would be around um, how do you encourage the venue to power down at the end of the day, turn off the lights? turn off the AV equipment as another example. Third one would be have 50% of the meals vegetarian. So take away meats, you know, for 50% of the time. Um, the fourth one is use an event app. Don't use paper for the agenda, yeah. itineraries, etc. And then the final one is actually try not to use merchandise. Mm. So don't have the giveaways because, you know, I hate to say it, often ends up in landfill but if it is that you need to have them then just make sure that you source them potentially from a diverse owned business or certainly make sure that they're recyclable so that's just five very simple things that we've just brought in that we try to encourage our stakeholders to think about no, it goes into much, much more detail. And this is the joy of having the person that transferred from sustainability ESG into our team. They could really take a look at this and really help us guide on sort of things that we should recommend to our stakeholders. And this is what the five key things that, that they come up with, which we now go out with. They're, they're simple things that anybody can do. Anyone can yeah. go, you know, it's not going to be a massive change in cost or cost anymore. In fact, it would probably reduce the cost. And, uh, and I love that about sustainability, that everyone thinks, oh, if we're going to be more sustainable, it's going to cost so much more. But actually, it does end up reducing the costs. Um, what are your views? You mentioned earlier in the conversation, SAF, sustainable aviation fuel. Um, well, what are your views on that? I think the challenge that you have is there's just not enough out there. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I think it absolutely is a viable option as long as it's produced in the right way, because I think there's a lot of conversation around out there about how it may or may not be produced. But I think the reality is, is that there needs to be huge investment on more plants to be able to make it so that then more airlines can take advantage of it. Because the reality is, I think it's, less than 1% of aviation fuel at the moment is SAF fuel. And yeah. so I think many companies would want to be able to purchase more, but there's just not enough out there to buy. So that's the reality of what we're living with at the moment. But, you know, you certainly see and hear of the investment that's going on. And I think just when you hear of what's going on broadly with government, et cetera, it's obviously going to become much more um out there for people to be able to purchase but just at this very minute there's just not enough yeah it's and it, it's not going to go fast enough and the only way that you know that i think that we can 
really make a difference is everything that you're doing and that is reduce as much of it as possible and really look at the priority trips that need to be taken and you know I I commend you I commend what you're doing um I, I know it's hard for the business travel industry because obviously they're an industry that needs to um to make money and survive as well so for them to completely transfer their business and say you know what we support reduction and we want reduction and make changes to their business do you final words do you what what do you think is next for um sustainable business travel i mean i, I don't think business travel is going to go away you know no. i really don't and i think that that need that people have to interact together will always be there. I just think it will be done in a different way. You know, I mean, I think virtual events are here to stay. You know, on our on our approval tool, actually, it says go virtual first. You know, we 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 actually calculate. We think it may be one kilo of carbon to do a virtual meeting versus not. So we put that out there. But I still think business travel will happen. I mean, I know that I am passionate about seeing the world and I always will do I just think though the pressures that we need to do to put on for the production of SAF will then be able to drive the industry to still go forward and I just think that we all collectively need to put that pressure on so the more companies that come out with very strong statements about what they're going to do to be net zero um, you know some of the things that we've said is around that we will only spend with companies that have set science-based targets, for example, yeah. and many other companies are doing similar things to that, that will drive the change that's needed as all of these different organizations, corporates out there do that. So for me, business travel is not lost. I think it will just change though. And I think there are some decisions that can be made around domestic air as an example. Does it need to be air? I know France looked at actually banning potentially domestic French air and encourage, you know, have everybody go by rail. Well, why not do that? And uh, I think we may start to see things like that happening, which I think is a good thing because you're still interacting, you're still traveling, you're just doing it in a different way. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And yeah, thank you so much for your tips, your advice. I know so many people are going to get so much and you've shared so many simple tips of what people can do to make their programs um, more sustainable and I really appreciate your time um, I, I you know keep doing what you're doing keep sharing the message and um, let, let's hope that the the travel industry can transform uh, as much as you have and you've been responsible for so thank you so much it's been such a pleasure Thanks, Sam, as always. Always great to speak with you, for sure. Yeah, have a good day. All right, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.